Russia invades Ukraine, and the response from the rest of the world? Sanctions and condemnation. Ukraine's president says that's not good enough. So, what can be done to stop this war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the biggest threat to peace in Europe since World War II. But the international response so far has been called weak and ineffective. At the United Nations Security Council, permanent member Russia used its veto to block a move against the invasion. India, the United Arab Emirates, and China abstained. Russia, which currently holds the Council's rotating presidency, says the resolution was imbalanced for not mentioning the Ukrainian government's own attacks on the Donbass region. We want to thank those who did not support this draft. I will not respond to those who accuse the Russian Federation of abusing the right to veto. One of the main reasons for our negative vote is not what is included in the draft, but what is left out. How we can trust you? How we can trust your assurance? You have no idea what is on the mind of your president. Your words have less value that, than a hole in the New York pretzel. You can veto this resolution, but you cannot veto our voices. You cannot veto the truth. You cannot veto our principles. You cannot veto the Ukrainian people. The U.S. and the European Union are preparing sanctions directly targeting Russia's president and foreign minister. The EU says it intends to freeze their assets abroad. The bloc had already announced measures targeting 70 percent of Russia's banking system, and it expects to decide soon on whether to exclude the country from SWIFT, a global system for financial transactions. Former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev responded by saying Moscow doesn't really need diplomatic ties with the West. Ukraine's president said Western allies aren't doing enough to stop the war. Volodymyr Zelensky wants to see more demonstrations within Russia and across the world. In every country of the world, in every country of Europe, take to the streets and demand peace for Europe and peace for Ukraine. Demand an end to this war. This is our right, this is your right. When bombs are falling in Kiev, this is not only in Ukraine, it's in Europe. When rockets are killing our people, it's death for everyone, for every European. Demand more protection for Europe, more protection for Ukraine as part of a democratic world. All right, let's bring in our panel in Lviv in western Ukraine. Michael Bosserkiu, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a former spokesperson for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. In Moscow, Natalia Pelevina, a political activist and British-Russian playwright. And in Alexandria, Virginia, P.J. Crowley, a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State. A warm welcome to you all, and thank you so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Michael, let me start with you. You are currently in Lviv. I want to ask you first how things are there right now. What are you seeing and what are you hearing? Sure. Thanks for having me. Well, just uh, before we uh, went on air here, um, air raid sirens were blaring outside with announcements for everyone to shelter in place and so on. Uh, that started at 6 a.m. this morning and is repeating intermittently, almost to the point where people don't know what to do. Um, outside on the streets, calm, but uh, a lot of shops closed, uh, pharmacies, that sort of thing. I'm saying it's, it's heartbreaking to see, but you're seeing a lot of families, um, couples, that sort of thing, with suitcases getting ready to go. I think some of them don't even know where they're going to go because it's so difficult to move around. Um, we're hearing of lineups or queues, rather, to the Polish border of several, several hours. So uh, most of the diplomats we hear are gone. I heard this morning that uh, diplomats from some of the neighboring Baltic nations have departed. That was about two days after the Canadians did. And then one last thing we're seeing, which is relatively new, is um, new anxiety from possible saboteurs. Uh, you see more police, uh, military types going around checking papers, uh, in a couple of cases taking people away. So um, that's, that's uh, quite uh, concerning if indeed those types of people are here now. 
PJ, we know that sadly, all the various rounds of diplomacy leading up to this failed to bring about a diplomatic solution. Do you believe that going forward, there is a window that would exist for potential diplomatic activity? Well, I think that once you unleash a major military, a gravitational force, you know, takes over. Um, the military that we see um, uh, coming from Belarus, Crimea, and Russia um, will probably, um, you know, proceed forward uh, until either it uh, achieves its initial objective. One would assume that's the uh, seizure of the government in Kiev. Uh, or it meets unexpected resistance. You know, I think there clearly will be a window that develops where di diplomacy can re-engage, but I think that window is some time off. Natalia, we've heard that Russian officials are signaling a willingness to hold diplomatic talks, but do we know under what conditions the Kremlin would consider any kind of negotiation? Well, no, um where Putin, Putin is initially coming from, um, what he has proposed to the West um, in terms of securing uh, Russian uh, borders, in terms of NATO closeness to the Russian borders and Ukraine not joining NATO, et cetera. That has never been something that West, West really properly considered, and I, I don't believe they will. Therefore, and Putin knows at this point that that's not going to happen. So I don't really see any uh, resultful negotiations taking place. I think that is pretty much off the table at this point um, on, on, on both sides. So I think there are there may be talks, you know, coming you know, surfacing once in a while that something is along those lines is, uh, is possible. Honestly, very few people at this point have faith in that, uh, at least in Russia. Michael, from your vantage point, uh, do you believe that there are any diplomatic strategies that could be employed to try and bring about some kind of a solution? Or is it just too late? Sadly, no, and it is too late. Um, I was saying for the past weeks that uh, the diplomatic toolbox was empty. There was, as you know, a lot of long table or shuttle diplomacy going on, but it didn't seem to move Putin. I think that uh, red line was drawn very, very clearly when Putin gave that uh, very bizarre long speech, uh, the blood curdling speech about, you know, how he sees Ukraine as a failed state, um, how he wants to essentially redraw the security map of, of Europe. So um, I think that the West now belatedly realizes it. They're trying to make up with new offers of weaponry and, and money. But, you know, given the current situation, and your correspondence today really outlined it uh, very starkly, is that. Uh, you know, I, I, as Putin further isolates Ukraine militarily, surrounds cities, it's going to be very difficult to go get those resupplies to the front line, to the operational lines. So, um, and even in a best case scenario, I know this from working several emergencies in the humanitarian aid field, is once the disaster happens, it's very difficult for entities to absorb new funding or new supplies unless you have a really good strategy. So. Many, many complex uh, parts to a story that doesn't look like it went very well. PJ, let me get your point of view on this. Uh, the latest rounds of sanctions that have been announced against Russia, against President Putin, against uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, are these enough or also is this too little too late? Well, I think it's important to um, impose a cost on Russia, you know, for what it is doing in Ukraine. Uh, invading uh, a sovereign country, uh, you know, out of the the whims and fears of a, a despotic leader. Um, so uh, that that is important. Uh, it, it's not to deter Russia at this point. Uh, in, in a sense, you know, these kinds of actions first and foremost are to you know reassure you know NATO allies that. Uh, you know, there, there is a cost to pay for these. And then, you know, secondly, to, to maintain the unity of the alliance. And uh, as Michael was alluding to, to the extent that the outside world can, you know, to try to help, uh, you know, Ukraine, you know, resist and survive uh, by uh, a variety of means, economic, military and political. 
Natalia, is there significant opposition in Russia to President Putin's Ukraine strategy right now? We know that there have been protests. We know that many people were arrested for protesting. I mean, have you been out there protesting? Uh, do you think there will be more protests? And, and does any of this worry President Putin? Well, I went out um, wrapped in the Ukrainian flag uh, yesterday, um, and I was not detained, but I was questioned by the police on a number of occasions, and they took my my details, ID uh, details down. I will go out tomorrow for sure. Uh, it is likely that me and my colleagues will be detained tomorrow because that's what police. That's the police's reaction at, at this point. A very harsh detention of anyone who goes out there to protest against this war, but that's not going to stop us. Um, does this scare Putin? Probably not. He has uh, other things to deal with. Um, and this is, you know, this has become a norm uh, in recent years. Uh, very few protests were allowed to happen without massive detentions. So, uh, it, you know, the opposition has been largely crushed. However, we are very much coming together now. And uh, I'm sure but outside our circles, uh, a lot of people are appalled by what's going on. Um, there is a certain percentage, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to say what it is, of people in Russia who do only solely listen to Russian propaganda and believe everything Putin is saying. Basically, that there is no war, there's a, liber um, a, a military operation aimed at liberating uh, the East, Eastern Ukraine. But I don't know how many of those people exist, but I, I know they do exist, unfortunately. But there, we're hoping that there will be a pushback um, coming up soon from a lot of Russian people. And this is not just because they don't agree with the, with the military actions in the uh, well, war in Ukraine. Um, it's also the economic um, stagnation that will follow and, and very much the significant impact that we're going to see happen in Russia uh, as a result of this complete tragedy. Michael, I saw you nodding along to some of what Natalia was saying there, so I, I want to give you the opportunity to jump in if you'd like sure. to. But I also want to ask you if, you know, from your vantage point, if you think that the fact that there have been protests in Russia, even at this early stage, if that is something that is worrying to President Putin. Yeah, well, we'd like to think that it is. Uh, but as we saw in, in Belarus and, you know, with the Navalny protests, they were crushed uh, very, very harshly. Look, I think in terms of um, uh, inflicting pain on the uh, circle around Mr. Putin and on Mr. Putin himself, um, I and other experts at the Atlantic Council have said that what needs to be done is to make a Russian oligarch outside the Russian borders feel worthless, uh, that they will be persona non grata or subject to even arrest the moment they step outside uh, Russia. So no more trips on their expensive yachts or private jets to the French Riviera to Miami, New York, whatever, that is finished. And they have to understand that. On Saturday, um, today, a, a Russian ship was uh, apparent, well, reportedly um, uh, seized by French authorities, and uh, the ownership uh, connection with, there was made with an associate of Putin. That's the type of stuff that needs to happen. One more thought on that. Um, I think, sadly, like we've seen in other theaters of war or conflict, if you will, is that the ordinary person is actually going to feel that pain, whether it's higher prices for food or inability to travel, that sort of thing. But I, I cannot help but think that Western strategists are thinking maybe that is one way a strategy is to make it so kind of vast, these sanctions, that the Russian people will say we're fed up, um, you know, we're claustrophobic, we feel isolated, and an uprising could happen that way. But um, I, I believe it's going to what Natalia said, that could be quite some ways off. PJ, I also saw you reacting to some of what Michael was saying there, so I want to I want to give you the chance to, um, to to jump in. But but I also want to ask you, when it comes to all of the diplomacy that that led up to this, uh, did diplomats, at least Western diplomats, grossly underestimate what President Putin would ultimately do? Actually, I don't think so. Um, the Biden administration um, had a very public strategy. Much of what it said. Uh, in the buildup uh, of Russian forces and the potential for the kind of invasion we're seeing has actually occurred. <laughs> um, it, it's not something that I've I've seen in 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 my you know decades long career. Uh, so so no, I, I don't think uh, it was underestimated. I, I do think that we have to kind of step back and understand that yes, we're in the middle of a 
a heightening crisis. Uh, but but this is a war that has been going on for at least eight years. Uh, you know, where uh, when the Yanukovych government fell in 2014. Uh, Putin has been, you know, uh, maneuvering, building up the ability to try to, you know, reimpose uh, a, a, a situ uh, an, an order in Ukraine that uh, he could control. So, so um, if if you want to talk about, um, you know, perhaps uh, underestimating what Putin was capable of doing, uh, probably the, certainly uh, that underestimation occurred in. 2014, 2015, far more than it did in 2021 and 2022. Natalia, what do you, what do you think? Uh, the Western diplomats who were involved in trying to avert this invasion, do you think that they were out of their depth? Did they fail to grasp the psychology of President Putin and what he was willing to do? Well, I think um, the West underestimated Putin for, for a very long time now. I myself had conversations at the State Department in Washington 10 years ago when I said, uh, look, he's going to show his true colors sooner or later. You, everyone will suffer. And, and they went uh, and in the response, well, no, we, we don't see that happening. He, he will stay within the borders at the very beginning. He's not going to do anything. Yes, he will repress his own people, you know, and in, uh, in the opposition. Too bad, you know. Um, but he's not going to go much further than that. That was real conversation I had 10 years ago. And now look what we have, right? So uh, there's been huge underestimation of, of Putin. Unfortunately, we, the opposition, kind of saw this coming. <laughs> I hate to be saying it, but it's true. Um, and it all happened, uh, what we kind of for, for, did foresee for many years now. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we weren't really heard properly within Russia or, or beyond uh, Russian borders. So um, now, you know, now it's too late. You know, it's, it's, we have this monster. How do we deal with this monster with a nuclear power? I don't know. We, we have to come up with something, but that, I think that is what the world is wrecking its brain uh, to, uh, to try and, and figure out. Um, and it remains to be seen what, what will come to, what solution is, is possible at this point. Michael, you know, former Russian President Medvedev has said that Russia doesn't really need diplomatic ties with the West. Is that really the case? I mean, is President Putin so insulated right now that it doesn't matter to him if diplomatic ties exist going forward or not? Oh, yeah, there's no question. Uh, remember, um, after the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, Russia was booted out of the wealthy club of nations, the G7. So, um, and then a um, couple of years after that, I believe it was, I actually wrote this in an op-ed, I was hearing that he's not even interested in rejoining that club. So I see, I think we're seeing um, a lot of disengagement from Russia. Look, uh, I, I think it was Medvedev himself who said, well, that's great. We won't have to, you know, uh, adhere to uh, human rights protocols. Uh, we won't have to arms agreements are out the window, even, you know, climate agreements. Uh, they will, um, their isolation will further lead them, I believe, into a tighter embrace with China. This has been happening over time, as you know. And um, let there be no doubt here whatsoever is the Chinese are watching this very, very carefully because the lessons learned out of this will help them design their eventual um, takeover of Taiwan. It's This thing has enormous, enormous consequences that will go on for years. Uh, it sends a chill down my back to say this, but uh, I don't think the world will be the same ever again the way we know it. And it's a very sad day, I think. Uh, PJ, you know, Michael was just talking there about the fact that uh, he believes China will be watching this very closely. Um, how much concern is there among members of the Biden administration as to what comes next, as to how much U.S. credibility is on the line, as to what impact this will have uh, when it comes to future diplomacy, when it comes to dealing with other autocratic leaders and states, uh, how much does this worry them? Well, I, I think it, it is um, not only norm shattering, uh, but system shattering. Um, you know, we, we, th this is the beginning of a, a, a new era in international relations, uh, and, and we're going to have to make you know, some adjustments. Um, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, to Natalia's point, um, you know, Putin is now completely unmasked. 
you know, so um, the first challenge is to um, is, is what we do, you know, outside of the borders uh, of Ukraine. You know, for example, yeah, despite, uh, you know, what happened in 2014, um, you know, oil and gas uh, imports from Russia actually increased over the last several years rather than decreased. You know, so um, to the extent that Russia does have leverage over the international system because of its export of oil, gas, and other minerals, it is vitally important for the West uh, to find ways to uh, to alleviate that leverage that that Putin has. And I think it's going to be critically important. The, uh, Michael's reference to to China and Taiwan is spot on, um, and and it is it is I, I think going to be a a major uh, initiative to try to drive a wedge uh, between Russia and China. And there's an opportunity to do that. You know, China speaks all the time about the sanctity of state sovereignty, uh, and yet they're obviously fudging, you know, what is happening uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I think it would be important for the United States and others to, to drive home to Xi Jinping. You know, there's no free lunch here. If you, if you side with Putin, there are going to be eventually be consequences to you as well. Natalia, is there anything that would make President Putin want to back down at this stage? I don't see what it, what that could be. I mean, the guy has gone mad, uh, not even within the last couple of months, but a long time before that. I don't know if you know about his phrase that he publicly said about, uh, you know, basically hinting at the possibility of using uh, nuclear um power of Russia, uh, when he said that we, as in Russians, will go to heaven and everyone else is, will just die like dogs. I don't know if you heard of this, but you can Google it. It's out there. It's, it's his actual phrase he said publicly. And it's, it's you know, you can find it. Uh, so with that kind of person uh, who has already gone this far, and we, we now know that there was no one around to stop him, to kind of alter this decision-making process, to, to influence him. There is no one. So at this point, I don't know what can what can happen to make him stand back. I mean, the guy is his, his you know, he's lost his mind. I mean, the, the, if you're in power for that long uh, and you have that much of an ego as he does, you know, that's it. It's a, it's a recipe for catastrophe. So, you know, let's just pray we survive this and there is no third world war. And then we can talk what we do next then. Michael, based on what you are observing on the ground there in Lviv, and also from what you're observing about what's going on geopolitically right now, just how dangerous a moment do we find ourselves in? Incredibly dangerous. And uh, again, being on the ground here, and you know, I've been was in Kiev before here, and then now here in Lviv, it's just absolutely heartbreaking to see what's happening to nuclear families here, small businesses. Uh, civil society, you know, it's really um, tough on people here. And, um, you know, I think what could be a difference here from other conflicts, you know, that could seem very far away, you know, in Africa or Middle East or whatever. I mean, these are Europeans that we're seeing uh, being killed. Uh, one more quick point, if I can. I think um, what uh, the West needs to do ur urgently, and I think you're, you're, well, the previous guest alert to this is that, um, the United States is going to have to uh, lead, I think, the effort to lessen its dependence on oil and gas from Russia. And unfortunately, one of the brave decisions, well, not brave, but perhaps bold decisions Biden is going to have to take very soon is to open up fracking again, that sort of thing, not, a, not necessarily environmentally friendly practices in order to achieve this goal. Um, we're going to pay a price for that as well in terms of perhaps a more you know, dirtier environment and things like that. But that leverage, to reduce that leverage Russia has over the rest of the world and over Europe especially is very, very important. The discussion has given us a lot to think about, but unfortunately we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Michael Bosserkew, Natalia Pelavina, and PJ Crowley. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.